Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bradersteen, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing a really heavy one. We're going to be discussing a horrific hate crime, and that is the murder of Gwen Orojo. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. So now that I'm done essentially begging you to join my cult, we can go ahead and get into this case. Now this is a case that was suggested to me by a subscriber named Medina. Don't worry, ma'am. I saw all of your comments. Um, I know you've been commenting it a little while and I finally got to it and I had never heard of this case prior to your suggestion. And now that I have, oh my God, I can absolutely see why this one resonated with you and stuck in your head. It is so fucked up. I am amazed that this case isn't discussed more because it is so horrific. And for just like the briefest of synopsises, basically what happened in this case is in October of 2002, 17 year old Gwen Orojo was murdered at a house party by a group of men who became enraged when they learned that Gwen was a transgendered woman. That's the bare bones of this case, but there's so much to it. From the numerous party goers who did and said nothing to the insane, in my opinion, rulings at the trials. And yes, I said trials, plural. It's just um, enraging, quite frankly, and incredibly disappointing. So today I'm gonna tell you that whole story. And I just wanna say right off the bat that I am not, in my opinion, the most well-versed on all the terminology that might be appropriate in a case like this. I'm not as versed as I think that I should be. Um, but I definitely do the best I can to learn as much as I can and to take information from those who know more than me or have life experiences that can open my eyes and make me see things for, for what they are. And just note, I'm going to be as respectful and appropriate as possible. And if there is any sort of misquoting or me saying anything that might be seen as disrespectful at all, it's completely from a place of a lack of information and not hate because I've got nothing but love for all my trans brothers and sisters. Um, I've got nothing but love for everybody except for people who suck, quite frankly. So that's, that's the bad on that. With all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the horrific hate crime that was the murder of 17 year old Gwen Barojo. Gwen Amber Rose Orojo was the second to four children and she was born on February 24th, 1985 in Brawley, California to Edward Orojo Sr. and Sylvia Guerrero. Her parents' marriage did not last though and the two were divorced when she was only 10 months old. Inside, Gwen had always felt like a girl. At a young age, Gwen told her family that she was in fact a girl despite being born biologically male. Her family fully accepted her and loved her no matter what. When she was a child, her sister enjoyed dressing her up and doing her hair, and Gwen loved doing hair and makeup and wanted to go to cosmetology school and move to Hollywood. Gwen was a beautiful person inside and out. She was always the life of the party, always making people laugh, and she was murdered in Newark, California on October 4th, 2002 at the age of 17. The 90 pound Gwen was killed by four men two of whom she had been sexually intimate with, who beat and strangled her after discovering that she was transgender. Though Gwen knew from a very young age that she was different and she had felt like a girl trapped in a boy's body from the time she was very young, she didn't officially come out to her family until 1999 when she was 14 years old. And at that point, she started living her life as a girl, as a woman. She um, toyed with different names. She went by the name Wendy for a while and also the name Lita before mostly settling on the name Gwen. She loved the name Gwen because it was the name of her favorite singer, Gwen Stefani. And from that point on, she lived as a woman. She dressed as a woman. Everything was as a woman. She grew her hair out long. She began hormone therapy and she had plans of getting the full gender reassignment surgery, but she was still pretty young. 
So there was a little bit of time before that was going to be able to happen. And in the meantime, she was just having to live her life as who she was in the body that she was born with. And this was hard because, I mean, as young as middle school, people were dicks about it. People made fun of how she dressed. People made fun of the way her voice sounded. And she ended up having a really tough time with that. And in high school, it got so bad that she transferred to an alternative high school before eventually just dropping out altogether. Gwen's mother said of Gwen, and this is Gwen's mother talking about Gwen prior to Gwen coming out as transgendered. And just keep in mind that Gwen's mother has since changed a lot in her, her mindset, um, how she, her pronouns that she uses, things like that, um, both in regards to Gwen and also to like all other trans human beings like her. But at the time that this happened, her mother didn't even know what transgender was like culturally. It was a big thing as well. Like it wasn't a thing that she understood. So this quote is a little bit dated, but I thought it was still worth, worth sharing with you. So Gwen's mother said of Gwen and I quote, he felt feminine and never, never felt masculine. I never understood what he felt. He came out three years ago and still was confused. Being who he was was very painful. He felt like a freak. Gwen Arojo first met Michael Magston, Jose Morel, Haran Neighbors, and Jason Cazares in late August or early September of 2002 at a house party where she introduced herself to the men as Lita. The night the group met, they hit it off really well. All the men were pretty attracted to Gwen and she seemed to be attracted to them. They like flirted and just kind of had like a good time. So they decided that they wanted to keep in touch, you know, switch numbers. I don't know if social media was a thing in 2002. Time escapes me. I think it was. Either way, they decided that they wanted to keep in touch and be friends. So they decided to do just that. But it was after Gwen and the men had separated that one of the men kind of started to get an idea in his head, wondering if... Gwen was biologically female. This was Haran neighbors. And he asked his friends like, do you think that might've been a dude? But none of the, the men took it seriously or really thought much about it after that. It didn't take long after that for the men to get back together with Gwen. Jose Morel had with his brother, him and his brother were renting a house that was considered like the party house. So they often had help house parties house parties there. And it was at one of these parties that Gwen came over and she often came over after they officially started hanging out. She would often come to these house parties to hang out and become, she kind of became one of the people who was often there. If you've ever had like a house party, a house party house, you know what that's like? There's just people always kind of cycling through there and Gwen was one of them. And it was at one of these house parties that Gwen and Michael Mag Magson, his last name messes me up. I'm just going to call him Michael. Gwen and Michael and Gwen and Jose Morel, who, you know, rented the home, became intimate. Not like the three of them together, two separate occasions where she was intimate with these men. And during the activities, she would tell them that she was on her period so that they wouldn't try to touch her because, you know, she hadn't had her gender reassignment surgery. She didn't want them to, you know, know that I imagine is why. And so they would just do other stuff and I'm not going to get into what stuff because it doesn't matter. You can look it up or use your imagination. In one of the articles I read, they had been interviewing different people and they had interviewed another transgender person. And this person's quote when talking about Gwen, I thought was important because I know there's going to be some people who think that she was like fucked up for not telling these guys in the first place that she was transgender. And I just think that this is a good quote to, um, I don't know, come to her defense, I guess a little bit. So this person said of Gwen, and I quote, she was by no stretch a perfect person, no Rosa Parks. She was just acting as who she was, a precocious young teenage girl. She was transsexual and she was killed for that. On the night of October 3rd, 2002, Gwen attended one of these house parties. And what happened to her that night is horrifying and unimaginable, but it ended with Gwen murdered, driven hours away from her home and buried in a shallow grave. But we're going to get into the specifics of what happened to that party a little bit later. So Gwen was not like totally a creature of habit, but a creature of habit enough that when Gwen didn't come home after the house party, her mother was worried. So on October 5th, she went to the police department and she did try to file a missing persons report, but it wasn't taken very seriously. And now why it wasn't taken seriously is up for debate. It's theorized that part of the reason is because she was transgendered 
And another reason was that Gwen was known to go to these parties, and some say that she wouldn't always come home the very next day, so they just didn't really think that her being gone was unusual, but her mother did. It didn't take long, however, for Gwen's family to start hearing rumors. It, they even got to Gwen's aunt, and the rumor was that a transgender girl had been outed at a party, had been killed for it, and was buried out in Tahoe. So as soon as her aunt heard this, her aunt called the police and told them what she had heard. And once police heard this, they started to take it a little more serious and they started actually going out and investigating the disappearance. And they went and they started talking to Gwen and to all of her friends, which led them to the Merrill house because that's where she was known to party. And from there, they started interviewing all people who would come and go from those parties and a clearer picture of what happened the night that Gwen disappeared started to come into focus. So two days after Gwen went missing, Haran Neighbors, you remember Haran Neighbors was one of the guys that Gwen had partied with, had been having fun with. Well, he was breaking. He was cr crumbling under the weight of what had happened. And he actually talked to a friend of his and he told this friend what he and three of his friends had done, a horrible thing that he had done. And this friend, upon learning about what happened to Gwen, did the right thing and immediately called police and told them what he knew. So this all happened pretty quickly after Gwen went missing. And this friend even agreed to wear a wire and to try to talk to Haron more. I hope that's how you say his name, it's Haron. J-A-R-O-N. Jaron? That can't be right, it's gotta be Haron. If it's not, I'm sorry, I don't really care. This guy's, you know, they all suck, so whatever. Anyways. His friend agrees to wear a wire and decides to talk to him to try to get police more information. And when he does, he speaks to Haran and Haran is just a mess. He tells his friend that like he's super nervous and that police want him to tell them everything, but that he's no narc. And his friend's like trying to calm him down. And it's like, it's okay, dude, don't even worry about it. Everything's fine. And he's like, not having it. He's like, bro, like, of course I have to worry about it. The police know everything. So police take these recordings and they confront Haran and they're like, so what's up dog? Like clearly something's going on. Clearly, you know, something, otherwise you wouldn't say this and confronted with this information, he cracks and he agrees to lead police to Gwen's body on October 15th. So two weeks after her murder, Gwen's body was found wrapped in sheets, hogtied and weighted down with rocks in a shallow grave, only three feet in the ground in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Gwen Arojo was mourned in a public funeral on October 25th, 2002. And you want to be really fucking pissed off. I don't know. Maybe it's, no, this will piss you off for sure. Um, members of the Westboro Baptist Church threatened to come to the funeral and picket the funeral. Fuck these people, man. They didn't actually, for your peace of mind, they didn't actually do it. But they, the fact that they even threatened to do it just immediately pisses me off. I fucking hate some people, man. Like, this is the type of people I'm talking about. Like, I, I have love for everyone unless you fucking suck. These people fucking suck. Anyways, they didn't show up. So good for them. Good for them. <laughs> the, um, the theme of the funeral was butterflies because that was Gwen's favorite symbol. I can only imagine that that's because it's the symbol of change and of changing into who you are and who you really are and beauty and all of that. Um, and since that was the theme of the funeral, there was a large cloth butterfly laid over Gwen's casket and her mother released 17 butterflies into the sky, one for every year that Gwen had been alive. And she said of Gwen during her funeral, and I quote, take your flight, beautiful butterfly, take your flight. And I'm sorry, that was actually Gwen's aunt who said that at her funeral, not her mother. But take flight, beautiful butterfly, take your flight. Gwen's funeral was just full of people, dude, both people who knew her and people who didn't know her, people who were just affected by her story and what had happened to her and the reasoning that it had happened to her. It was a very traumatic thing for a lot of people because it's such a fucking horrible thing to happen. And Gwen's own grandmother ended up fainting during like passing out during the funeral and needed medical attention. Students that were going to be uh, performing in the show, the Laramie project, which if you haven't heard about it, I mention it in my, my Matt Shepard video. I'll link that. I'll try to remember to link it up either way. If you search the Matt Shepard, uh, case. You'll find it on my channel. It's, it's a really absolutely horrible case and it goes more into what the Laramie project is, but students who were going to be in the, in the Laramie project came to Gwen's funeral 
and they came dressed as angels and they stood outside the church and they sang Amazing Grace. The priest conducting Gwen's funeral said, and I quote, there are people out there who are against what you are gathering here for. Let's love them too. Otherwise, what is not understood about other people becomes violent. A candlelight vigil was also held for Gwen on another date at a park that wasn't far from her home, and more than 200 people attended this candlelight vigil. So though she had like a lot of bullies and a lot of problems at school with people who just weren't accepting of who she was, there were still a number of people out there who cared for and loved her. Once Gwen's body was recovered, the police quickly moved forward on arresting four men. And the four men that were initially arrested were Michael Magdison, Haran Neighbors, Jose Morel, and Jose Morel's older brother, Paul Morel. But Paul was quickly um, released because once they started looking into it further, two witnesses who were there at the house party the night of the murder came forward and said that Paul left the house before the crime ever took place. So he wasn't actually there. He was just initially arrested, probably because it was his home. The two witnesses who came forward and said that he had left were his girlfriend and his brother. His girlfriend was Nicole Brown and his brother was Emmanuel Morrell. And you might want to keep those names locked in your head a little bit because they do come back. Emmanuel comes back just like in a little bit, but definitely Nicole Brown comes back into the story. Fucking Nicole Brown. Michael, Haran, and Jose were all charged with murder on October 17th, and they were all held without bail in jail. Without bail in jail. It's a good sentence. Yeah. Jose Morel's mother, upon learning what had happened, um, wanted to get a message to Gwen's mother. And this message was, and I quote, I'm sorry for what happened to her son. This is her referring to Gwen, just so you know. I didn't raise my son's to do something like that. But if my son did take part in this murder, then he's where he's supposed to be. Another man ended up being arrested in relation to Gwen's murder. And this happened after Haran neighbors. You remember Haran? He was in jail. After he was arrested, he was in jail and he wrote a letter to his girlfriend. And in the letter, he wrote about how the group had planned a soprano type hit to kill the bitch. Fucking this guy, even in jail, he's still being a son of a bitch. And this letter was, of course, intercepted by police, because if you're writing letters from jail, the police can read your letters. And in going through the letter, they also found that there was another man who was implicated in this letter in Gwen's murder. And this was a man named Jason Cazares? Cavares. Cazares. Jason Cazares. So he was arrested on November 19th, so about a month after the other men were arrested. And prior to him being implicated in this letter and being arrested, he was being treated by police as just a witness. So I'm sure he was really stoked on his friends for opening their big mouth and getting him arrested as well. But I mean, I'm glad that they did. So speaking of Haran neighbors, Haran neighbors ended up coming to a deal with the prosecution in which he would plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter as opposed to being charged with murder. And this came with a sentence of 11 years. And in exchange, he would testify against the other three men at trial. During the entry of his plea, the judge did warn him that he could still be charged with murder if the prosecutors found that he wasn't, quote, living up to his end of the bargain. But during the trial, which began on October 14th, 2004, Haran neighbors gave a detailed account of the murder and burial. And I'm going to tell you about it now, about what he says happened that night. On the night of October 3rd, 2002, Gwen attended one of the house parties held at the Merrill home like she usually did. And in attendance was Jose and Paul Merrill, who rented the home, their younger brother, Emmanuel, Michael, Haran, Jason, and a friend of the group, somebody who was, I guess, Paul Merrill's girlfriend, Nicole Brown. And the night was normal. It was just like a typical party. They were drinking, they were having fun, they were playing dominoes, everybody was chill. Even Gwen and Nicole Brown were chill. They had previously gotten in like a fist fight and this night everything was cool. And I guess speaking of that fight so you can know what had happened that night is, or what had happened during the fight between her and Nicole previously, is that I believe they had been at a house party and Nicole Brown had been trying to convince Gwen to do a strip tease for the guys. And for some reason this turned into a fight, you know, alcohol tension. People aren't being their best selves. And they ended up getting into a fist fight. And during this fight, Gwen's strength was noted because though she was smaller in stature than Nicole Brown, 
Gwen was very, very scrappy and was able to win this fight. And Nicole got berated for it because Nicole was also a scrappy girl. She was like a guy's girl, you know, and she often won fights. But Nicole said to the guys, oh, well, she fights like a, like a dude. <sighs> but either way, they had this fight. Things, you sobered up, you decided you were cool. You were friends again and everything was cool the night that Gwen was killed. The two had seemingly squashed their beef and were being civil and they had even hung out that night the night that Gwen was killed they had even hung out they went on a run to 7-eleven to get more alcohol and more cigarettes and Gwen had confided in Nicole at that time that she had a crush on both Michael and Haran. Now the energy of the night changed when it started being discussed around the party goers that Gwen might not have been born biologically female. Now how this conversation started exactly I'm not sure there's different reports but one of the reports I saw was that this came from Nicole Brown, that somehow the fight between the two of them had come up and like, oh man, how is it that you lost? Blah, 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 blah. And that's when Nicole said like, you guys saw she fights like a man. Regardless of how it came out, once it did come out, the men got very upset and they started kind of talking amongst themselves, going back and forth on how they felt and what they thought. And though there was a lot of ups and downs and like, no, it can't be, yes, it is, da, 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 da. One sentiment that was repeated, through all of them pretty consistently was that if this was true, if Gwen wasn't born biologically female, she was going to be in trouble. During his testimony, Haran said that Jose Morel said that night upon learning that Gwen might not have been born female. And I quote, I swear, if it's a fucking man, I'm going to kill him. If it's a man, she ain't going to leave. He then told the court that in response to this, Michael Magson said, and I quote, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then Haran said that in response to this, he himself said, quote, whatever you do, just don't make a mess. In the early morning hours of October 4th, 2002, Michael Magson went up to Gwen and told her that she needed to tell the truth about her born gender or alternatively and preferably let him touch her genitals so that he could confirm himself. And she obviously declined this, uh, this request. And at that point, Nicole Brown started to egg the men on saying that somebody should forcibly inspect her. So at this point, Michael grabbed Gwen and forced her into the bathroom alongside him. About a half an hour later, when the two still hadn't come out, which I don't know what was happening in that bathroom for that half an hour. And I couldn't find it anywhere, but either way, about a half an hour later, Nicole Brown went into the bathroom and that's where she found Gwen sitting on the counter, um, appearing very drunk. So Nicole decided to take it upon herself to spread Gwen's legs and look up her skirt herself. And when she did, she saw that Gwen did still have biologically male genitalia. And in response, she screamed, it's a fucking man. And all hell broke loose and all of the men in the house became enraged, became violent, became aggressive, um, particularly the men that Gwen had been sexually active with. Um, Jose Morel just started to cry uncontrollably. And the other three men, Michael, Haran, and Jason went outside to smoke and figure out what they were going to do. Nicole testified at trial that she tried to help Gwen at this point, that she told Gwen like, bro, they're fucking pissed. If I was you, I would leave. I would get out of this house. I would run and I would run as fast as I can. But that when Gwen did try to leave the house, she was confronted with the three men who were outside smoking. So Michael, Haran, and Jason forced Gwen back inside the house. Emmanuel Morel, Paul, and Jose's younger brother also said that he tried to help Gwen and tried to get her out of the house, but that when he tried, he was prevented from doing so by Michael and Haran. And Jose was just beside himself, hysterical. He vomited upon learning and just kept repeating the sentiment of, I can't be fucking gay. Nicole said that in response to this, she tried to comfort Jose and also tried to get Gwen out of the house, tried to get them to let her go saying to Jose. And I quote, it's not your fault. I went to high school with you and you were on the football team. Any woman who knows you after this, it, it's not going to matter. Just let her go. After Gwen was forced back in the house, Michael grabbed at her skirt, tried to rip it up and expose her genitals. And when Gwen tried to stop him, he punched her in the face, knocked her to the ground, and then put her into a chokehold and had to be stopped by the other men in the house. Gwen cried 
hysterically and begged for the men to stop, telling him, like, please, no stop. I have a family. I have people who love me. But at this point, the men were so pissed and were sort of in a mob mentality and were just feeding off of each other's energy. Jose Morel, who had previously just been like crying and upset, was now super enraged as well. And he grabbed like a can, I think it was a can of like cat food, like a, a, an aluminum can, and he struck Gwen in the head, denting the can and cutting open her head. He then grabbed a frying pan and he struck her in the head with that as well. And the last words that Jose Morel heard Gwen say was, I told you, I'm sorry. These are the last words he heard from her. Now, these two men that are being the most violent here, um, Michael and Jose, are the two men that Gwen was sexually active with, just in case you don't remember, since I was at the beginning of the story. Once the fight began and Nicole Brown saw how pissed off these men were, her, Paul Morell, and his younger brother, Emmanuel, all left the house. Nicole said that she knew that, like, Jose wouldn't do anything, like, Jose wasn't capable of, of murder, but that she didn't know the other guys well enough to know what they were capable of, and that, you know, she had two of her own kids at home that she needed to think about, and that Paul was also on probation, so they just wanted to get as far away from the situation as possible. Did they call for help? No. Did they do anything that could have helped Gwen? No. They just left. Shortly after Nicole, Paul, and Emmanuel left the house, Jose, Jose, no, Haran and Jason left the house as well. And they got in Michael's truck and they were going to drive to Jason's house to pick up shovels and a pickaxe while the other guys stayed at the home to quote, kill the bitch. And it was testified by Nicole Brown at trial that after she and Paul and Emmanuel had left, they had kind of circled the block and drove back by the house. Why? I don't know. I don't really know the area, but she testified that she did see these men leaving in Michael's truck. So it was confirmed that this did happen. When the two men returned, Gwen was still alive. She was still conscious. She was sitting on the couch and she was bleeding from her head wound. And once Jose noticed that she was bleeding on the couch, he ordered her off the couch because he needed to clean it. And he started like aggressively cleaning the blood stain on the couch and on the carpet. Now, I don't know if he wanted to get rid of blood specifically or to get rid of evidence that something was happening. But either way, he cleaned up the stain and then he went into his room where he says he spent the rest of the night crying. After that, sometime after that, the assault against Gwen continued with the other men egging Michael on saying to knock the bitch out. And this is when he hit Gwen in the head with his knee slamming her head into the wall as hard as he could. This hit was so hard that it knocked her unconscious. It dented the wall and it broke the plaster off the wall. And while Gwen was unconscious on the ground, Jason started to kick her. Once Gwen was unconscious, Michael then bound her wrists and her ankles and wrapped her in a bit of bedding to minimize the blood that was getting on the carpet. And then the group carried her out to the garage. The beating that Gwen endured was so bad. It was so bad that later at trial, the defense attorney tried to have photos of the crime scene omitted at trial because essentially they made his clients look fucking terrible. But the judge ended up disagreeing with him and most of the photos were admitted as evidence. But that just goes to show how bad it was that the defense was like, we can't even show the photos of the crime scene because it shows what fucking monsters you men are. Now, what specifically happened to Gwen and by who in that garage is unclear because it's at this point that the men just are all turning on each other and claiming that this person did it, no, this person did it, just deflecting blame altogether. But the general consensus is that Gwen was then strangled with a rope and hit twice in the head with a shovel. And the men said that when she was strangled, they weren't sure that she was dead. But once she was hit twice in the head with the shovel, they were certain. The autopsy showed that Gwen had died from strangulation associated with blunt force trauma to the head. Gwen was then placed in the bed of Michael's truck and the four men drove her body a couple of hours away, burying her near the Sierra Nevada mountains in a shallow grave in the El Dorado National Forest. And apparently they were still just talking shit about Gwen as they buried her. There was no remorse there, dude. No coming to terms with what they had done. It's just so disgusting. And speaking of disgusting and a lack of remorse, on their way home from burying a girl in the desert that they had just murdered, they went through the drive-thru and they got a little McDonald's for breakfast. How do you eat after something like that? I just don't understand people. 
Haran neighbors testified that, quote, he couldn't believe anyone could ever do that. And that Jose Merrill added, while burying Gwen, that, quote, he was so mad he could still kick her a couple more times, end quote. It is worth mentioning that Haran also believes that his friends were raped by Gwen because Gwen, quote, didn't come clean with who he really was using male pronouns and um, that he believes his friends were raped because his definition of rape is forcing sex on someone and that Gwen had forced homosexual sex onto her, onto his friends. And when asked, like, how exactly did Gwen force them? He said, quote, through deception. Anyways, later that day, the day of the burial, Nicole Brown called the men to try to find out what had happened that night. She spoke to Jose on the phone and was like, things were fucking wild when I left. Like what ended up happening? And Jose said to her, quote, let's just say she had a long walk home. It's just so frustrating, man. There were so many people who were at that party who didn't do anything, who heard about what happened after the fact and didn't come forward and tell anybody, just let her family, Gwen's family, worry. And during the investigation, police started to realize just how many people knew and didn't say anything. And they said that there was like five or six people who all knew what happened and were just all keeping their mouths shut. And it just makes me so frustrated. I don't understand it. Um, and it's really gross. It's really gross. Anyways, on August 25th, 2006, Haran neighbors received an 11 year sentence for his part in the crime because of the deal he made with the prosecution. Haran said before being sentenced, and I quote, I know my words offer nowhere near a sense of consolation. I do not forgive myself. I don't see how I ever can. Haran, after getting his only 11 year sentence, even though he had been there and had went and gotten shovels and did nothing to help, he got his 11 year sentence. Then he was given credit for time served and he was released in 2016. Excuse me. I just looked at my notes sometime before 2016. So even sooner than that. Anyways, during the trial, um, Gwen's attorney, or not Gwen's attorney, the attorney for Gwen, though, the, uh, the prosecution was pretty disappointing. They used male pronouns when describing Gwen and they used her dead name when talking about her as well. And it's just disappointing to, to consider because these are the people who are supposed to be like speaking for her and they're just kind of being a little bit disrespectful, maybe ignorant, probably ignorant, but either way, it's just not what you want to hear. But moving past that, they said that the men who had murdered Gwen had decided, and I quote, that the wages of Orojo's sin of deception was death. The defense tried to claim that these men should be charged with manslaughter and not murder because they were essentially freaked out beyond reason to learn that they had had sex with a man and that they were essentially employing the gay slash trans panic defense, which is like a branch off of the gay panic defense, which has since been made like no longer a thing in California. Fortunately, that defense can no longer be used in California. And this was actually done in Gwen's name with the help of her mother's activism. Her mother had made a promise besides her daughter's casket that she would be her voice until people stopped dying for who they are. But at the time, this was still an accepted defense. And this was the defense that this is the defense that the defense was going for that essentially these macho straight men panicked at the idea of gayness and had to kill somebody about it. <laughs> so fucking stupid. Prospective jurors for this trial were asked a series of questions. They were asked if they knew any gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans people, or if they knew any same sex married couples, or if they had ever interacted at any point with a human being that was transgendered. And then they were asked the very specific question of quote, whether they had seen a movie or theatrical performance depicting the activities of a transgender person. I had to read that one. I wasn't going to remember that one. One of the defense attorneys explained that the reason that that last question was asked is because they wanted to know specifically if prospective jurors had seen the movie Boys Don't Cry, which is based on the murder of Brandon Tina, or if they had seen the Laramie Project, which is based on the murder of Matt Shepard. 
I do have videos on both of these cases on my channel. Brandon Tina is one of the first ones that I covered like forever ago now. And one of those cases that first got me really into true crime as a child, because they're just both so fucked up, just like Gwen's case, horrible hate crimes that will just destroy you from the inside out. Um, but I would still suggest watching them. If you want to, I will try to remember to link them. If not, you can search them on my channel because they are important stories worth remembering and worth talking about. Anyways, this question ended up being removed actually um, from being asked to prospective jurors because it was believed that if they asked this question, that people would then go home and watch these movies. And in doing so, it would taint the jury pool. The DA said of this case, and I quote, one can debate the propriety of one choosing to identify with a gender other than the one they were born with. But I trust juries to understand that people don't get to make life or death decisions simply based on someone's lifestyle. That's not a world in which I want to live or most people want to live in. After nine days of deliberation, the first trial ended on a mistrial because the jurors were not able to come to a unanimous decision regarding the three men. The jury did agree that Gwen was murdered. I mean, that's pretty fucking clear, jury. But what they couldn't to decide, what they couldn't to decide, what they couldn't decide on was whether or not they all believed that it was premeditated. And so they couldn't come to a unanimous decision. But the jury was given the, the option to instead of, uh, to instead of, to, be able to find the men guilty of second degree murder or even manslaughter as opposed to the first degree murder charge, which is interesting because I didn't know that was a thing. I thought like you charge them with something and they're voting on that. But in this case, they were given the option like, hey, if you don't think it's first degree murder, you can find them guilty of second degree murder or you can find them guilty of manslaughter. But in the end, the jury wasn't even able to make it past the first degree deliberations. And so it ended on a mistrial. Publicity by transgender activists was actually given credit for informing the public about the type of tactics that the defense had been using to sort of blame Gwen for her own death. And right after the mistrial, Gwen's mother was granted um, a petition. She was given permission to legally have Gwen's name changed to Gwen, which and like have her sex legally changed to female so that at the next trial, the defense had to refer to Gwen as she and had to use female pronouns, which would drastically change, I believe, the jury's mindset when looking at this case. Gwen's mother also had Gwen's name legally changed to Gwen Amber Rose Arojo, and this was the name she had chosen when she was pregnant with Gwen in the event that Gwen had been born female. So she changed her name to honor her that way. The second trial began on May 31st, 2005, and the courtroom was packed for this hearing. Michael Magnuson, Jose Morrell, and Jason Cazares were charged with first degree murder with, quote, hate crime enhancements, which meant that if they were found guilty, their sentencing could be enhanced because of the fact that it was a hate crime. Now, you want to be annoyed with me? Like, maybe. I think you will. I like bringing you guys with me through my frustrations with cases, but Maybe you won't find this frustrating. I don't know. Or maybe I'm taking this the wrong way, which is also true. But at the second trial during Michael's portion, like Michael's portion. Anyways, a tape was played and it was a tape of Michael's interview with police where he first was arrested. And in this interview, you can hear the police officer essentially coaching Michael. Okay. Telling Michael to use the trans panic defense. He said to Michael during this interview, and I quote, the outrage and embarrassment you must have felt. I can only imagine. You'd be surprised. Moms, especially moms, if they knew the facts, you'd be surprised. Now, apparently this cop was just trying to like make Michael comfortable to get him to open up about the murder. Like give him an out like, hey, maybe this is why you did it. You know, cops do do that. But I don't know, something about it hits my ear a little fucked up. But that could just be me. I am also sensitive to those types of things personally. But let me know what you think down below. During the closing statements at this trial, one of the defense attorneys said that his clients were just, quote, ordinary human beings who were guilty at most of manslaughter because of their 
case of a classic heat of the moment crime. To avoid a second mistrial, the prosecution made sure to tell the jury, like, listen, we're going after a first degree murder here. But if you can't come to a decision on that, you can give second degree murder. Or in just Jose's case, Jose Morel, he is open for manslaughter. Okay, so please make a decision. We would like first degree murder on Michael and Jason, especially Michael, because they saw Michael as the ringleader that actually did the strangling of Gwen. So they're like, we would prefer that, but there are other options. And the prosecutor said of Michael Magdison, and I quote, this is actually a, a loose quote, so it won't be an and I quote moment. He essentially just said that Michael Magson was a poor excuse of a man with a stupid and moronic list of excuses for why he murdered Gwen. The defense tried to argue this, saying that like the this murder only happened because of a very, very specific and unusual set of circumstances that are very unlikely to present themselves again. So the chances of these men killing another person is highly unlikely and that they didn't have criminal records. So they'd probably be just like, a-okay. And the judge responded to this, calling this crime, and I quote, a brutal beating of a vulnerable human being. After a week of deliberation, Michael and Jose were both found guilty of second degree murder. This is Michael and Jose. They were found guilty of second degree murder, but they were not found guilty of the hate crime allegations. And later in an interview, a juror said that the reason that they convicted them of murder was, and I quote, the community standard is not and cannot be that killing is something a reasonable person would have done that night. This juror continued by saying essentially that they had not found these men guilty of a hate crime because they didn't really believe that it was a hate crime. They said that they didn't believe that these men had killed Gwen because she was transgendered, but they had killed her because, quote, of a situation that had just gotten out of control. But I have to respectfully disagree with that assessment because the situation got out of control because these men lost their cool because they learned that Gwen was transgendered, right? So like, if she hadn't been transgendered, they wouldn't have lost their cool and they wouldn't have gotten themselves into a situation that they then couldn't control. But that's just me. The human rights campaign president, um, at least at that time, I don't know if he's still the president, his name was Joe, and he said of Gwen's murder, and I quote, Gwen was brutally murdered because of hatred and to claim anything else is the real deception. The prosecutor, Chris Lamero, said of this, and I quote, Gwen being transgender was not a provocative act. It's who she was. However, I could not further ignore the reality that Gwen made some decisions in her relation with these defendants that were impossible to defend. I don't think most jurors are going to think it's okay to engage someone in sexual activity knowing they assume you have one sexual anatomy when you don't. That's the prosecution, the person who is fighting for Gwen. And that's, that's his opinion. And he, you know, was entitled to it, I guess. Michael Magdison and Jose Morel were both given 15 years to life in prison for second degree murder. While Jose Morel showed great remorse and sorrow to Gwen's family, Michael showed none. Uh, he seemed pretty pissed off at the verdict and has shown literally zero remorse since being arrested. Now, you're probably sitting there like, wait a minute, there were three of them. What happened with Jason Cazares? Well, the jury was deadlocked on Jason with a vote of nine to three in favor of him being guilty of murder. Yeah, that's a good sentence. To avoid having yet another trial, a third trial, Jason ended up pleading no contest to manslaughter and was given six years in prison with time served. Jason then asked the court if he could wait to start his sentencing until his child was born because his, his baby's mother was pregnant and his child was going to be born in just a couple of months. And the prosecution responded to this saying, and I quote, it's difficult for me to entertain a request like that when Gwen Arojo is dead. But in the end, this request was granted. This guy got to wait and be on the outside and be present while his child was brought into the world before he started serving his time for murdering Gwen. 
In September of 2006, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the Gwen Arojo Justice for Victims Act into law. The law limited the use by criminal defendants of the gay trans panic defense by allowing parties to instruct jurors not to let bias influence their decisions, including bias against the victim based on his or her gender identity or sexual orientation. Then in 2014, assembly bill would be signed into law, which further restricted the use of the gay trans panic defense. This meant that defendants could no longer claim they were provoked to murder upon discovering the victim's sexual orientation or identity. In response to Gwen's murder, Horizons Foundation, which is an LGBTQ plus foundation, announced the establishment of the Gwen Arojo Memorial Fund for Transgender Education that would be awarding grants to Bay Area school programs that promote understanding of transgender people. Gwen's murder had a ripple effect in both positive ways, like mentioned above, with the foundations and the memorial funds and the education, but also in negative ways where it refers to where it applies to Gwen's family, as I'm sure you can only imagine. Gwen's mother, Sylvia Guerrero, prior to Gwen being murdered, was a paralegal and she had worked in this company for a very long time. But after Gwen's murder, she started suffering from PTSD. And the last I read about her, she was homeless due to this and had just been moving her items from place to place in a car that she had borrowed from a friend. She said of losing her daughter, and I quote, When Gwen was murdered that night, it was the beginning of a life sentence for me and my family. Brandon, then 13, and Michael, then 10, lost their sister, and in many ways, also their mother. I can never begin to make up for the time we lost as I struggled to deal with the grief that began that night. Now for a quick little where are they now segment, um, I can give you some, some, some where are they now. Um, Haran Neighbors, as I said, served his time and was released sometime before 2016. Jason Cazares, the man who was there and said he was like outside smoking when it happened, the one that had the baby on the way, that guy, he did the same. He served his time and he, and he was released. Jose Morel was granted parole in 2016, and this release was actually supported by Gwen's mother, Sylvia, though some of Gwen's family disagreed with this and thought that none of these men should ever get out. Sylvia was at least open to him being released because he did show remorse from the very beginning, from like the moment he was arrested, he was one that was showing remorse. And he said that in the beginning, he was honestly feeling mostly remorse for himself and he felt sorry for himself, which honestly is at least honest of him to say, but that the gravity of what he had done didn't really hit him until he had his own child who died in 2011. So he got to see what an impact, what he had done actually was because he experienced loss himself. He said of his crime, and I quote, I am truly and sincerely sorry. I wish I could go back to that terrible day and erase it. I realize that you may never forgive me, but I ask that all of you at least try. Which I will say is a, is a fucking tall order because I, I know that some people can forgive. I don't know if I would ever be that person though. Like I might not, I don't think I'm that big of a person. I don't think I could. I don't think I'd want to. And I don't know if I think they deserve it. Like that's just my opinion, the truth. Um, but I do always, I'm always in awe of families who can do that because no. <laughs> when Michael Magnuson came up for parole in 2016, it was determined that he was not ready to be released back into the public. Like he had not been reformed. And Gwen's mother, um, Sylvia was also very against his release because he's just been kind of a dick and never showed any remorse. And when his parole came back up again in 2019, it was again denied. Um, because again, he's never showed any remorse and apparently he's also developed a pretty bad drug and alcohol problem while in prison. Gwen's mother, Sylvia, who in the wake of her daughter's murder has become a pretty open trans activist has said of her activism. And I quote, we still have a long way to go because people like Gwen are still being murdered for who they are. And there's families who are suffering like we are. We have a long way to go before a trans person can be free to live their lives to live out their dreams and goals like they deserve. And I want to end this with one more quote from Sylvia about Gwen. And she said of her daughter's legacy, and I quote, she didn't die in vain. In death, she has literally saved thousands of lives. I can't tell you how many people have told me because of your daughter, I am free to be who I am. 
And with that quote, that, my friends, is the story of the horrible murder of Gwen Arojo. Isn't that just so sad, dude? These kind of cases, like, just break my heart. They're so upsetting. Imagine, just imagine being Gwen in that moment, being just hopeless and on the ground and surrounded by an angry group of men who you thought were your friends, who you thought cared about you, who are just so mad and beating you and trying to kill you for just being who you are. And they end up strangling you. That's horrible, dude. It's unthinkable. I can't even imagine how scared and confused she must have been. And it, it's just, it makes me fucking insane. I cannot imagine just being that hate filled. And man, the fact that this wasn't deemed a hate crime blows my mind because it seems very clear. These men became enraged because they learned that Gwen was transgender and they believed that she had tricked them. So they went into a rage and they killed her about it. Like it seems very black and white to me. Um, and please, please don't come with any victim blaming bullshit. It's not necessary. It's not helpful. It doesn't add to this. Um, you don't have to say every thought that pops into your head. I don't know if you knew that you don't have to. Um, because even if you believe that Gwen was a horrible fucking person and that how dare she do what she did and she tricked these men and she raped them because she tricked them into homosexual sex by not being honest. She didn't deserve to die about it. And that is a hell I will die on. And honestly, any people who leave those type of comments just look like assholes. They're just announcing that they're dicks. So if you want everyone in the, know, in the comment section to know you're an asshole, I mean, I guess go for it, but we'd prefer that you didn't. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Gwen with me today because she was an important person worth remembering. These types of cases just make me feel so sad. I feel so sad for Gwen. I feel so sad for what she went through. And I feel so sad that she never got to like experience life or live life as who she actually was. She never got to go through the surgery. She never got to like have that full, full circle experience. And it's just so sad. And I can't even imagine, oh, I can't even imagine what that's like to be born in the wrong body, how just like trapped you must feel. And then to also have to live with the knowledge that some people will hate you so much just because that it's just heartbreaking, man. But anyways, transition. Um, please let me know of any cases you'd like to see me cover down below. As this case indicates, if you leave me a suggestion, I will try to get to it. And if I do look into a case that you've suggested, I will try to give you a shout out because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out new videos every week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my merch store. If you want to pick up some merch, I have this shirt along with many other shirts for your shirt buying and wearing pleasure. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.